Good morning, and thank you very much for this invitation. I'm a member of the Norfolk Geodiversity Partnership. Uh, we're a voluntary group promoting earth heritage conservation and communication. Uh, we are a member of the geology trusts like Herefordshire and Worcestershire. Um, can I move the slides along myself or? Okay, right. Um, Norfolk's ice age ponds are part of a group of relict ground ice landforms. They formed in periglacial conditions during the last cold period, the Devensian, which ended about 12,000 years ago. Um, periglacial is a term referring to conditions associated with cold, non-glacial environments. Right, can you see me now? Huh. Uh, yeah, associated with cold, non-glacial environments, which are characterized by areas of permafrost. In other words, permanently frozen ground. Permafrost has an active layer near the surface, which thaws in summer. In this picture, we can see an example of a periglaciated landscape along the Fen edge. Uh, or, or in, this, in this case, it's Suffolk, not Norfolk. Um, this is what we call hummocky ground. It's not the same as the hummocky terrain, which Beth uh, explained. Um, it's otherwise known as hills and hollows. And it's developed in wasted peat overlying chalky soils on the Fenland edge. In the periglacial conditions, the active layer in the chalk was subject to a seasonal churning process, swelling up with ice in winter and then melting and subsiding in summer. This eventually led to the blotchy patterning we can see in these arable fields. Uh, the hills and hollows here though are mostly ploughed flat now. There are some rare fields where you can actually see the original hummocky terrain. Uh, next one, please. Thank you. Ramparted relict ground ice depressions, what I call GIDs, are another kind of periglacial landform. They often contain ponds, as seen here at Stowbeden Common. The great age of these ponds has been confirmed by analysis of the fossil pollen in their mud. The Stobedon and Thompson Common site has a very diverse water beetle fauna. Next one, please. That's it. Um, there's an isolated population of a very small water beetle called Hydroporus glabriusculus. It has a northern European ecological range today. Um, it's found in Scan northern Scandinavia um, with a few relic populations in Poland and the North German Plain. And this suggests it's been surviving here for the past 10,000 years. Next one, please. Here are the ramparted depressions at nearby Thompson Common. You can see the ramparts very clearly here. This area has been cleared of scrub by the Wildlife Trust. So how did these landforms originate? Next one, please. Ramparted GIDs in Norfolk originated as different kinds of ice mound in periglacial conditions. Next one, please. There are two types of ground ice relevant to ice mound formation. There's injection ice and segregation ice, and they give rise to different classes of landform. Next one, please. The first class is a closed system pingo, which is generated and formed by injection ice. As we can see in the diagram, water is injected upwards under hydraulic pressure, for example, above a spring. It feeds a mound or blister of ground ice. Next one, please. The second class of ground ice landform is an open system pingo, also generated by injection ice. We start from a lake, which is underlain by unfrozen saturated sediment. Um, this is what is known as a tarlic, um, a general uh, term for unfrozen 
ground in, uh, in a permafrost setting. As winter approaches, permafrost encroaches on this tarlic or unfrozen sediment and it traps the water which is then pressurized by the encroaching permafrost and it's injected upwards through a point of weakness in the permafrost layer. So you can there it's being injected upwards and eventually it forms a blister of ground ice. Next one please. Here's an alternative scenario, this one from Sweden. You've got a slope and you've got um, an active layer, which you can see um, sandwiched between a solid fluxion sheet and the bedrock. Uh, you've got a dry riverbed on the right. In autumn, water is moving down slope within the active layer and it gets squeezed between permafrost fronts encroaching from below and from above. Solid bedrock also helps in this squeezing process. The water is then injected upwards by hydraulic pressure through a weak spot in a developing permafrost and so creating an ice mound. Next one, please. Here's a picture of a pingo today. Uh, it shows a dome-shaped hydraulic pingo from Baffin Island in Canada perhaps about 10 meters high, though some are much larger than this. Classic pingos are solitary mounds, but there are also ridge-like forms found in the Arctic, depending on the shape of the underlying tarlic. For example, it might be an unfrozen riverbed. Next one, please. The third class of ground ice landforms comprise lith ulcers and pulses, which are both generated by segregation ice. They appear as swarms or clusters in the landscape. Next one, please. They form as segregation ice grows as lenses or layers within permeable materials. And it is fed by a process called cryosuction. This is a technical term for negative pressure which develops within the soil as it freezes and water migrates through it by capillary action. It migrates towards the ice and then uh, the ice begins to grow. Next one, please. Lith lithalsas are formed by segregation ice in water retentive sediment, for example, silt, whereas pulses are formed by segregation ice in absorptive peat. This diagram shows how the, uh, there's a lens of frozen ground and then you can see the sand underneath it and the water is being recruited by cryosuction up and the lens of ice is swelling. Next one please. This is what a lithalsa or pulsar field looks like. You can see that it's, there are clusters of these things uh, and um, some have got uh, some of them have melted and some of them have got blisters or lenses of ice in them and they're swollen up. So, reviewing the different ways in which ice mounds can form, we understand that different processes can give rise to them. Relict GIDs in Norfolk may be um, the result of different processes. They may be what we would call polygenetic phenomena that have different origins. Different processes may give rise to similar looking landforms. So, we're interested in knowing um, how uh, they came about and investigating how these landforms originated. Next one, please. But before going on, I'd just like to say how the ramparts formed. Uh, they developed during the cyclical growth and decay of the ice mound. Next, please. Um, as it grows, the mound shrugs off its overlying layers of sediment through seasonal solid fluxion, which is um, essentially soil flow in the active layer driven by gravity. So in this picture you can see on the left you've got the lens of frozen ground and on the right you can see the lens is growing and the through the soil flow, the solid fluxion, the mud is sliding off the mound 
and uh, there's some cracks appearing and eventually I suppose the sun will get in and the thing will melt. Eventually you get a ramparted pond developing in the depression that's left. Next one please. Now let's have a look at some specific examples of relict GIDs. In 2019, the Norfolk Wildlife Trust carried out a volunteer exercise mapping the likely relic GIDs in the Breckland area. This was building on work by uh, Andrewina Wormsley of the Trust in 2008. A set of likely relic GIDs was identified and mapped, as you can see here. They're clustered along the river valleys and also along the Fenland edge. Next one, please. What criteria can be used to recognize likely periglacial ponds and distinguish them from the myriad of other ponds in Norfolk? I mean, if you're on the Claylands, which is where I am now, there are ponds everywhere. How can we be sure that they're not um, um, they're not just ones dug by the farmer. Um, Beth has touched on some of these uh, categories. Um, here's a list of some of the proxies which we use. Um, the landscape position. Um, they tend to grow, uh, sorry, they tend to be found uh, on low ground in valley floors, along the lower slopes of valleys and along the fen and edge. Presence of surface water nearby river or wetland basin for the likely static recharge of the tarlix. Circularity, they tend to be circular oval depressions due to a localised feeder source or localised tarlic. They tend to cluster in swarms due to shared genetic factors within, within a given landscape facet. Ramparting is often present. There should be potential hydraulic head, uh, higher ground um, giving head for the uh, injection ice to develop. Presence of pattern ground, uh, which is, uh, we've seen that earlier in the hummocky ground, evidence for frosty phenomena, particularly along the Fenland edge. Suitable superficial geology, um, presence of permeable sand, silts, periglacial head, alluvium and peat to hold the segregation ice. Suitable bedrock geology, in particular the presence of chalk bedrock or putty chalk uh, for feeding the injection ice. Um, the presence of chalk near the ground surface too, that's important. And also the presence of less permeable layers, for example, clay beds or hard layers, which are likely to produce springs Another category, suitable soil types. We've noted that six soil types are associated with known relic GIDs and hummocky ground. We think diagnostically, uh, the presence of paleo environmental evidence, stratified late Devensian or early Holocene fossil assemblages um, is a diagnostic uh, criterion. Um, and perhaps circumstantially, the presence of a relic Devensian fauna, the presence of those beetles, for example, um, uh, a, a faunal assemblage containing present day boreal uh, relics. Next one, please. Let's have a look at some examples in the field. Here is a relic ground ice depression at Stonebridge. It hasn't yet been investigated by coring, but its landscape circumstances allow us to suggest a plausible periglacial origin. It's one of a cluster of ponds. Next one, please. Here you can see uh, on the uh, left, uh, you can see these um, ponds. There's about sort of 10 or 12 of them, uh, irregular ponds. The one that uh, I showed you in the picture was um, just near the hedge line at the top there. They're lying at the foot of a gentle slope. The blotchy field on the right there uh, is, has got a layer of cover sand on top of it overlying chalk. And the field on the far left there is developed on chalk. So we've got chalk bedrock, we've got a shallow valley, uh, we've got um, the presence of cover sand on the right and uh, chalk 
uh, on the left. So we think that the uh, water was percolating down through and emerging in the valley uh, through artesian pressure generated by chalk springs beneath the permafrost. So these are probably examples of open system pingos. Next one, please. And the geology map there, show, the X marks the spot of the pond, and you can see the alluvium uh, small valley and the chalk bedrock and the layers of cover sand uh, on the right there, uh, which have given rise to that blotchy um, patterning in the field. But the original pingos are well preserved in the valley. Next one, please. Here's another example of an open system pingo. This one is at Didlington. It's one of a small cluster uh, associated with a spring head in a shallow side valley next to the River Wissey at Didlington, uh, and it's developed on chalk bedrock. Next, please. And you can see here in this tree throw pit, um, you can see the chalk, uh, putty chalk, in fact, which is uh, periglaciated chalk bedrock. It's been frost shattered. It turns into a sort of consistency like cottage cheese that you can see here in this picture. So there's the chalk is very close to the surface and these are undoubtedly uh, examples of, of open system pingos. Next one, please. Frost's Common um, at Hockham is a contrasting site. Um, it occupies occupies plateau land away from valleys, although it is close to a large basin mire called Cranberry Rough. The ponds at Frost Common are typically about 10 to 20 metres in diameter. Some form elongated beaded depressions over 30 metres long. Some are just little more than just damp depressions in the ground. Next one, please. Cranberry Rough was a former lake called Hockham Mere, which was drained in Tudor times. It contains a fossil pollen record dating back to the Devensian, and it's the site of classic research by Godwin and Tallentire in 1951. The terrain immediately to the north of the common, you can see where the words Frost Common are on the, on the, uh, on the LIDAR map. Um, you can see it's been artificially flattened for forestry purposes, um, but presumably there would have been depressions underlying that. Attempts have been made to drain many of the ponds by the Forestry Commission. You can see chains of ditches uh, linking some of the ponds. Next one, please. Frost's Common is underlain by glacial sands and clays rather than chalk. The bedrock itself is about 40 metres down, so it's unlikely to have played a direct role in the origin of these GIDs. The subsoil is a variable mixture of sands, silts and clays. It's an example of, of what Beth uh, was describing as till or boulder clay. These uh, relic GIDs probably developed here through the growth of segregation ice within the mineral rich sediment. So these are examples of lith ulcers. The ones near the lake may have originated as open system pingos or perhaps even pulses. You could imagine that back in Devensian times, the water levels may have been quite high and they may have influenced ground ice development at Frost Common nearby. Uh, I, in one of the pictures that Beth showed, it showed a lake and then some ponds nearby. I wonder if there's a similar uh, uh, environment there as well. Next one, please. We'll now move to a different site known as Watering Farm. It's in Thompson Parish, next to the Triple SI called Thompson Water, Thompson Car, and Thompson Common. The old map shows relic clustered GID ponds on the valley floor in Thompson Car. In that map, you can see um, various Thompson Water, which is an artificial lake um, with the um, you can see there's a dam at the left hand end. Um, the, uh, you've got a cluster of ponds fringing the valley side and occupying the valley floor as well. Next one, please. The Wildlife Trust bought the fields next to Thompson Car. So you can see the car woodland at the top. You can just see one or two ponds within the woodland. 
And then if you look at the field closely, you can see these green blotches, smudges in the field. These are damp depressions in the field. Next one, please. The Wildlife Trust began looking at the possibility of excavating some of these depressions in the field to create new wetland habitat next to the Triple SI. The depression in the picture here extends into Thompson Carr, although it's been um, cut through by the boundary ditch, which is where the fence, is, fence line is. Um, the ones, there are no surviving ramparts to the GID in this um, side uh, of the fence, but in the wood, the ramparts are surviving well. They're still intact. Next one, please. The project has two aims. Firstly, to identify a biologically viable seed bank in the mud for what's called ghost pond regeneration purposes. Secondly, to research the environmental history of these depressions. That's where my work has been focused. We excavated five depressions last September. This is site number two with Dr. Charles Turner and Professor Carl Sayer seen here checking the biodiversity potential of mud in a core sample. We've got Norfolk Wildlife Trust um, on the left uh, and um, Charles Turner is in the middle and Carl Sayer is on the right and they're looking at one of these um, core samplers. Next one please. The infill of site number two shows it to be a shallow depression. The basal unit here is putty chalk with a thin layer of sandy silt on top of it. Then above that you've got an organic rich mud which contains finely scattered heat crackled flint fragments. And I'll explain a bit more about those and their significance in a minute. And there are also some rare bits of animal bone. And then over the top you've got a diametric infill of sandy clay with broken flints. This is not natural. Um, this is evidence of backfilling for agricultural purposes. So they, the, the f sometime in the past, probably in the early 20th century, the field was backfilled, uh, sorry, the depressions were backfilled with this um, mixture of materials. Uh, we found bits of polypropylene string and also broken wood in similar deposits uh, uh, at, at, this, at another site, another one of the depressions. Next one, please. Here is a deeper site, um, number six, much deeper. The coring here, which you can see Charles uh, and um, Les Leach, who is a wildlife, um, uh, a Norfolk University partnership volunteer. Um, they, their coring did not reach the local basement. In other words, they didn't hit, hit the part of shore. There was much evidence of human interference in site number six. There is a trench filled with cobbles leading down to a layer or platform of flint cobbles and small boulders, which may have been intended as a soak away or a hard standing for cattle. And on the right in the wall of the trench there, we found drainage pipes. In fact, they were crossing the site altogether. They were from one side to the other. Drainage pipes, firstly terracotta ones, and then on top of that, to put in later plastic pipes. So these are, are evidently part of 20th century efforts to do drain of depressions. Interestingly, in the background, can you see where it's, where I've written pot boiler mound? Uh, there's a small concentration of prehistoric heat crackle flint found lying on the putty chalk and silt surface. Next one, please. And we did find one prehistoric flint flake in the organic rich mud layer but it was not of any diagnostic industry. You can see it's um, started out as grey flint and it's been dyed brown by the peaty soil. Next one. Heat crackle flint. Um, mounds and scatters of this stuff are common in the Brex valleys and along the Fenland Eds. They're known as pot boiler sites. Um, in this picture you can see small lumps of grey flint uh, within the soil, uh, set in a black um, peaty looking matrix. In the, in the days before heat proof 
pottery. You could boil water in a leather bag over a fire, or you could heat stones and drop them into a receptacle of some kind, perhaps a box uh, or wood-lined pit. We think that these were these sites were used for economic and social activities, for example, dyeing clothes, brewing beer, communal feasting, or holding sweat lodges. And next one, please. Uh, flint pot boilers themselves are distinctive. They have um, uh, sh uh, f uh, shattered and uh, fragmented uh, look to them with the crazed um, surfaces. They look a bit like bits of crumbly raku pottery. This one uh, was next to one of the um, pingo ponds at Diddlington. Next one, please. At the moment, we're still collecting information at Watering Farm. However, our findings suggest that the depressions in the field have a very low biodiversity regeneration potential. The ghost ponds are definitely defunct, but um, obviously they could become um, uh, stepping stones, uh, enhancing ecological um, resilience in the local landscape. The, when I was there um, in the last summer, um, that field, uh, there were so many water beetles hopping around in the grass there. It must be one of the richest <coughs> water beetle sites. So we imagine that these ponds, when they're um, opened up, will um, be a significant biodiversity uh, resource. What are our next steps for the paleo environmental work? Well, Dr. Lorna Lynch at Brighton has secured fun funding for studying sediments. Next one, please. Here you can see this is one of her box samples she's taken from the silt underlying one of the ponds. Um, where she's got some money to undertake pollen analysis and uh, get getting some radiocarbon dates on any wood that we find in the sediment. Carl Sayer and Helen Burningham at UCL are working with the Wildlife Trust to identify other potential ghost pingo regeneration sites in the local area and the paleo team including myself would like to obtain pollen profiles from ponds in the Thompson Car Wood. Next one please. Here is one of the ponds in the car which we may investigate this year. I think this is the pond which was extended in the wood uh, from the depression in the field which I showed a picture of earlier. So, to sum up this presentation, um, relic GIDs in Norfolk are likely to have had a variety <coughs> of origins. Different processes may give rise to similar looking landforms. Uh, we think we've identified clear examples of open system pingos and lithalsas. The pond mud is likely to contain an interesting paleo environmental archive as well as stratified geology and archaeology. A multidisciplinary approach is needed to, to do justice to these ancient features. And thirdly, we do need to look, be on the lookout for evidence of human disturbance in these features. Thank you. Um, is, does anyone have one, any questions or should we move on? Thank you, Tim. That was absolutely amazing. And lots of parallels with um, with what we see in Herefordshire, um, particularly the. Um, sorry. Thank you, Tim. Um, that was amazing. Uh, lots of parallels with what we see here in Herefordshire, um, and the uh, ghost pond restoration and research is very interesting, and we'd certainly like to do more of that in this part of the world. So. Um, we have a number of questions online, but if I can pass this microphone around and see if you have any any questions for Tim. My job is to read the questions online that have been asked, as well as people waving frantically in the audience. I've just seen the first one. So for the people who've just typed questions, um, I know you lot can't see them, so I'm going to have to read them out. I'm sorry I've got my back to you. So, um, someone's asked, is there any progress in understanding where the all good soil samples show beneath peat beneath boulder clay? Uh, sorry, no joy on that, still working on it. But we are still investigating. 
Um, we're going to talk about some of the samples uh, and some of the sites later. So this is where on the stirt we were digging a pond. I think you're going to see it in a bit. Uh, and in doing so, we dug down where we didn't think there was peat, and then looking for the water table, stumbled on peat about two meters below the ground surface. And that's two meters of clay we've gone through, uh, which didn't look very promising. So we're still trying to find out whether it's peat, whether it's in wash, where it's come from. Uh, we do hope to carry on working on that one. Um, but where we found peat in other ponds, um, I know one of our speakers after the coffee break is going to talk a lot more about that. And I, for one, am interested to hear what it's got to say. And someone else has asked, um, when we find stuff and we think that it's not quite the same, do we pass it back to other organisations? Um, the Hereford Worcestershire Earth Heritage Trust is the local geological record centre. So when we find stuff, it won't surprise you to know, we tell everybody because we're excited. And we also put it on our records. And uh, if people come to us and ask, do you know about anything? We do, and that happens. Um, we do go to them and go, actually, we've got this site. Um, we do try and liaise. So we are trying to spread the word of what we find, encourage people to go away and find out more, get people involved, because we think this area is really interesting. Um, whether we can get maps updated is a different kettle of fish. That's part of the question. So I know that someone at the back frantically waved at me with a question, so I'm going to go over there. I feel like I'm telling you, people can't see me. No, them on the screen. Hello, um, I've got a question for Tim. Is it peat? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, great. Um, I can hardly hear what you're saying. The, um, the, um, big top sits the microphone here, <laughs> but other people might not want to do that. Um, the flints you found in your ponds, were they... The what, sorry? The Paleolithic finds, the flints. Yeah, the flint, yeah, yeah. Are they um, on above the uh, glacial surface or below it? So is that pointing to pre-glaciation human occupation or post-glaciation? No, it's definitely in the um, organic uh, rich mud. The mud itself is very humified um, um, and we think it's been exposed to the air for, for quite a while. Um, we're, we're pretty sure that the, uh, well, okay, here's a working hypothesis. We assume that the, the putty chalk and the silt, um, that, which forms the basement of these depressions, we are assuming that this is of late Devensian age. So that puts all of the pond infill into the uh, into the Holocene. Um, the, but one of the reasons we want to do some of the pollen work is to get some pollen profiles from these core samples so that we can compare what's going on in the field with what's going on in Thompson Carr in the woodland. So we've got the, the undisturbed sites in the, in the woodland and we've got the disturbed sites in the field. Um, in terms of this flint, as I say, the industry is non-diagnostic. I personally think it's probably late Upper Paleolithic, Mesolithic. It's got, it just feels like that way to me. And that type of brown flint, I haven't found in Neolithic or, or Bronze Age contexts. So I've only ever seen it in Mesolithic or late Upper Paleolithic. So I'm assuming that it's um, Holocene flint uh, and it, it, it's broadly contemporaneous with the heat crackled flint which is found scattered within that organic rich mud. Okay, thank you. Can, can people hear me? No, I can. Okay. We've got a question here from Paul Thornley. Um, Herefords, are Herefords Ice Age ponds pingos, essentially? Are there pingos in Perry Lakes or? periglacial ground to the south of the ice front as well as kettle holes in the in the air in the area did you hear that tim yes well i mean i would say that i would keep your mind open on that i wouldn't call them pingos until you know what 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 the genesis of these things are in other words you need to do a bit more work but i suspect from what i've seen that do you remember that uh, swedish example where you've got um a slope uh, and you've got um, the water is squeezed, um, uh, injection ice um, is water, water is being squeezed uh, 
by encroaching permafrost fronts from above and below. I, I suspect that, um, I mean, East Anglia, we've got kind of soft, softish substrates. Um, I guess in Herefordshire, you've got much more stony material. I would imagine that you've got the possibility of lith ulcers here uh, uh, um, uh, and also um, open system pingos. I suspect that, 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 that once we understand more about how these different depressions uh, are formed in, in, in Herefordshire, I suspect that you'll find that you've got examples of both of those. But as I say, um, we don't, uh, yes, we, we don't have kettle holes in East Anglia. Um, I don't think there's one being identified definitely in East Anglia. Um, doesn't mean to say they're not here, but um, one would expect them to be present across the Clayland Plateau, for example, but they're not. Um, if I can cut in, uh, Tim, just to say, uh, Paul, who was asked online, um, asked about pingos and um, ice features and permafrost features. I'm delighted to say we do have new information. This is information that I can't give you because I don't know it. But we have a speaker this afternoon who's been doing some really interesting work. And this is really earth shatteringly news because uh, she's done it in Herefordshire. It's funded by the project and she'll be talking later. So what I would say is for Paul, um, it's coming. We're going to find out really soon whether we think there's some permafrost features. Um, but it's in very interesting to hear. And it was Tim who put us onto this a couple of years ago when he hosted us for a visit in Northam. So thank you very much.